In this episode, we're heading down to Korea's south coast to catch up with Korean naval commander Lee Sun Shin. As we're going to see, Commander E is increasingly having to face enemies on two fronts. The Japanese on the one side and his own colleague, Korean Naval Commander Won Kyun, on the other. That's coming up. As always, before we get going, please subscribe to this channel and smack that like button if you think this video deserves it. Thanks. When we last checked in on Chola Left Navy Commander Lee Sun Shin, it was late summer, 1592. He had combined forces with Chola Right Navy Commander Lee Ok Ki and Kyongsang Right Navy Commander Won Kyun to sink more than 200 Japanese ships, blocking the Japanese Navy from advancing west to the Yellow Sea. Now it's early fall, 1592, and the Japanese Navy it's given up. It's pulled all the way back to Pusan. The Korean Navy, meanwhile, has gotten even stronger. A number of warships that had been rushed into production at the start of the war are now complete, increasing the size of the combined Korean fleet to 166 ships, 74 of them large Panokson and Kobukson battleships. With this large increase in strength, Lee Sun Shin orders an attack on the Japanese fleet at Pusan, leading the combined Korean fleet right into the heart of the enemy stronghold. It reaches the mouth of the Nakdong River on October 4th, and scouts are sent ahead. They bring back word of 500 enemy ships anchored in Pusan Harbor. Lee Sun Shin had dominated the Japanese up to this point, but he has never taken on a force so large. This is almost the entire bulk of the Japanese Navy, all concentrated together in one place. Can the Korean Navy really take it on? The Koreans continue on toward Busan the following day, October 5th, 1592. They encounter and destroy several small groups of Japanese vessels as they proceed, 24 altogether. When they reach Pusan Harbor, they see 470 Japanese ships anchored close to shore. The Japanese aboard them, as soon as they spot the approaching Koreans, scramble ashore and race to fortifications overlooking the harbor. For the rest of the day, the Koreans methodically pick away at the anchored Japanese fleet with cannon fire and fire arrows as the Japanese fight back from their positions on land. The Japanese have cannons now that they've captured from the Koreans. But even these, firing stone cannonballs the size of grapefruit, they can't stop Lee Sun Shin's fleet. His Panokson board-roofed ships and Kobukson turtle ships are too heavily built to be seriously damaged. Pockmarked by musket and cannon fire and festooned with fire arrows, extinguished by the wet straw piled on their roofs, the Korean battleships continue their attack until sundown, when the fading light forces them to pull back. When it's all over, the Koreans have destroyed 130 Japanese ships, fully a quarter of the remaining Japanese fleet, at a cost of five Koreans killed and no ships lost. That's right, zero. This brings the total number of Japanese ships sunk by Lee Sun Shin since the start of the war to approximately 350. The Korean Navy went quiet after that. With no support coming from the Korean government, Lee Sun Shin releases his men to help with the rice harvest so that they have food to get them through the winter. It won't be until the following spring, 1593, that they will head back into action. 
With the Chinese army now in Korea, Pyongyang retaken, and Seoul hopefully next, the Korean government at Weiju orders Lee Sun Shin to prepare to ambush and destroy the retreating Japanese when they are driven south and return to their ships. Lee Sun Shin launches several actions against the Japanese in the months that followed, including a combined land and sea attack at Ungchon with the help of monk soldiers. Finally, the Japanese fall back to the vicinity of Pusan, but they don't take to their ships to return to Japan, as Lee Sun Shin had been hoping. They don't venture out into open water at all where the Korean Navy can destroy them. Instead, they erect a string of forts along the southeast coast and dig themselves in. By this point, Kyongsang Right Navy Commander Won Kyun is becoming an even bigger problem. It was Won, remember, who sank his own fleet back at the start of the war. With just four ships remaining, he was placed under Chola Left Navy Commander Lee Sun Shin's overall command, even though Yi had fewer years of military service. This was the start of Won's resentment toward Lee Sun Shin that he had to serve under an officer that Wan considered junior to him. Yi's subsequent success against the Japanese, then his promotion to the specially created post of Supreme Naval Commander, has now made Wan even more resentful and more jealous. He has started drinking heavily and doesn't obey orders. He holds back in action, letting others do the real fighting, then sweeps in to cut off heads. And he repeatedly tries to bait Yi Sun Shin into making foolhardy attacks. When Yi calls Wan's bluff and orders him to rendezvous with his ships to go into action, Wan doesn't show up. The whole thing for Wan is just a game. Wan Kyun is also chipping away at Yi Sun Shin's reputation in his official reports using his own phony calls to action, which Yi has mostly ignored, as proof that he has lost his fighting spirit. These smears, amazingly, are given serious attention. Certain government officials actually side with Wan Kyun, the commander who sank his own fleet, over Yi Sun Shin, the nation's greatest war hero. To understand what's going on, we need to take a quick look at politics in Chosun Dynasty Korea. The government was divided into two competing factions, the Eastern Faction and the Western Faction, locked in a ruthless struggle for power. In Korea, if you were a government official, it wasn't enough simply to get your opponent kicked out of office so that you could take his place. Ideally, you wanted to see him thrown into prison or sent into exile as well. When it came to politics, the Koreans played hardball. This never-ending political struggle was put on hold from the start of the invasion until on into 1593, as Korea's fate hung in the balance. By the summer of 1593, however, the worst of the danger has passed. Pyongyang and Seoul have been retaken, and the Japanese army is withdrawing south. And so, inevitably, the Korean government starts falling back on old habits. For the Western faction, out of favor since the start of the war, this means searching for ways back into power. It can't directly attack Prime Minister Yoo Song-yong, the head of the Eastern faction. He has too much influence, too much power. Instead, the Westerners look for weaknesses in the lesser officials around him and in the men that Yoo Sung Yeon has appointed, men like Korea's Supreme Naval Commander Yi Sun Shin. By picking away at Prime Minister Yoo Sung Yeon's outer defenses, his circle of supporters, they hope to weaken him and ultimately bring him down. This is why Won Kyun's reports smearing Yi Sun Shin are given serious attention, because they're useful ammunition to be used against Prime Minister Yoo Song Young, who was instrumental in appointing Yi to naval command. Wan Kyun is eventually reassigned. 
the conflict between him and Isun Shin can't be allowed to continue. Far from being reprimanded or demoted, however, one with the support of the Western faction is given a promotion. He's put in command of the army, first at Chungcheong province, then of Chola. Even though he's no longer in the navy, Wan will continue to criticize Isun Shin in his reports. And Western faction officials in Seoul will continue to listen. Isun Shin is now in an impossible position, in part a victim of his earlier success. The Korean government, expecting miracles from their hero, is becoming increasingly disillusioned with Yi because he's not driving the Japanese from southern Korea. The Japanese are dug in on land, they're a land force, and yet the Korean government expects Yi Sun Shin to somehow defeat them with his ships. Chinese commanders in the south, meanwhile, are ordering Yi not to attack the Japanese because this will upset negotiations. And so Yi Sun Shin sits at his base on Hansan Island, shivering with typhoid fever and feeling embattled. It's at this point, heading into 1596, that he writes his now famous poem. By moonlight I sit all alone in the lookout on Hansan Isle. My sword is on my thigh. I am submerged in deep despair. From somewhere, the shrill note of a pipe. Will it sever my heartstrings? strings?